Nick Majerison here. Welcome to Top Med Talk. Time now for one of the talks taken from EBPOM 2018, the hugely successful conference that took place at the Institute of Engineering and Technology earlier this year. Paul Wishmeyer presents perioperative nutrition. Have a listen. So I will start by welcoming to the stage Paul Wishmeyer. You've heard him speak already. He's the Vice Dean for Clinical Research at Duke. He's the Director of the Clinical Nutrition Service. He's the perioperative medicine lead for the Duke Clinical Research Institute. But as you also know, a, a great, great speaker. So really looking forward to this presentation. So in the first talk, I covered the preoperative preparation of patients nutritionally and the role of malnutrition in our patients. In this talk, I'd like to cover what happens afterwards to our patients and what we can do to make that better, right? Because as we heard about Joshua, he survived all of the typical hospital complication, hospital outcome things that we measure and, and obsess about. But ultimately, in the end, Joshua was a victim, not a survivor. How can we change that? And that really, I hope, is the goal of all of what our care is, not just to ensure people live, but that people survive. The goal, of course, being to create survivors and not victims. And the question, again, becomes, if your patient leaves the hospital alive, was your care successful? And I think from the patient point of view, who wants to live to be 70 like this in the room? All of you. Or perhaps who wants to live to be 100 like this? Hopefully none of you. And so it comes down to quality of life versus quantity of life. And in my other hat as an ICU physician, it's a discussion, of course, we have a lot. And to really understand how important quality of life is to people, you need to ask someone else. You need to ask people like this. No one cares more about quality of life than people like this, and I can assure you you have to do more than eat right to look like this. But a very interesting and fairly famous survey was done of Olympians, Olympic power athletes like this gentleman, a number of years ago, and they asked them a simple question. They said, you're offered a banned substance, a steroid or anabolic agent perhaps, with two guarantees. You won't get caught, and you'll win your event. How many took it? Yeah, except for these three who shouldn't have been there in the first place. Let's change the question, though, and make it a little more relevant. Now you're going to, you're told, win your competition, every competition, for five years, and then you're going to die. How many took it? More than half. This is what quality of life means to a 20-year-old. These were all 18 to 20-year-olds, by the way. What can you imagine it means to a 70-year-old? Again, I think we need to begin to value these outcomes much more vigorously than perhaps we have before. Because we know that in surgery and in critical care that, yes, the mortality from critical illness has fallen by half, and mortality from sepsis has fallen by half in the last 10 years. There's a wealth of data to show that. But the outcomes of our patients and the complications they're actually experiencing now because of it, both cognitively and physically, as you've heard all day, are devastating. This is just one piece of data that I didn't hear Linda present that I thought I'd mention. These are 40- and 50-year-old ARDS survivors. 50% of them will not go back to work at a year, and a third of them will never go back to the job they had before because they're physically or cognitively unable to do that. And again, this is a large number of patients. If you're on a ventilator more than a week, you're going to have this. It's more devastating than we ever knew. And so how can we begin to change this? But first, why is it happening? Right? Why are we losing the quality of life battle? And, and you heard some from Linda today, but I, I want to relate to you again what I said before. You can lose a kilogram of lean body mass a day after major surgery or ICU stay because of the inherent catabolism we're evolved to have. The problem is we don't know when to turn it off, and so hypermetabolism and catabolism can persist for months to years. A burned child will remain hypermetabolic for two years after their burn wounds closed and they're out of the hospital. Gree Vandenberg in Belgium studying survivors of ICU 10 years later, looking at epigenetic changes that are likely permanent and passed on to our future generations after ICU. The other issue is we watch patients gain weight back, but it's not muscle weight, it's fat weight. Again, we remain catabolic persistently, and so our patients have much more trouble gaining back. They have much more anabolic resistance. Again, we're not evolved for this. We don't know when to flip the switch off. Mother Nature never intended any of our patients that see the OR or see the ICU to survive in the first place. So this truly is an epidemic we're facing, and I think in the ICU world we've woken up to this, and in surgery we're waking up to it 
as you heard Miles talk, cognitively even more and more. So what can we do to start winning this war? And I think ERAS is really targeted to do that, and the key role that nutrition plays is essential. And so going back to our guidelines and recommendations, where do we start after we've gotten through the preoperative process and now we're at the time of surgery? And of course, the nutritional piece of ERAS at the time of surgery starts with pre-op carb loading. What is the role of that? And our guidelines and our suggestions say that, first off, of course, pre-op fasting from midnight has to be abandoned. It's, it's not been part of our guidelines as anesthetists or anesthesiologist for years. It wasn't even when I was a resident. But yet we still do it. I see it written in charts at Duke every day if a patient's inpatients going to surgery. And, of course, I had surgery on my arm a little while ago at Duke, and I got called and told not to eat anything after midnight, despite the fact that, of course, we know that that's not what we should be telling people. And not only that, we should be doing something to prepare them for surgery. And I'm going to give you an analogy that hopefully will make more sense than me just telling you this in a moment. This carb loading thing makes basic physiologic sense, and everybody else who is going to go under anticipated stress, whether it be in the athletic world or any other world, would never starve themselves or dehydrate themselves before they underwent that stress. And that's really the key factor here, right, is to minimize the stress response to surgery because that's what leads to catabolism. That's what counteracts all of the positive life outcomes we want for our quality of life for our patients. And this comes back to the basic question, what is our metabolic response to injury? And I'll advocate to you whether it was a saber-toothed tiger that bit your leg off, the surgeon that hit you, or the car that hit you, in Italy more than other places, that perhaps the response is the same, actually. We only have really one evolved way to respond. And, of course, we're not evolved to survive for weeks. We're evolved to survive for hours, the critical hours of trauma. We have the metabolic reserve to ideally survive probably three to five days, maybe even only 48 hours in many cases. That's because no surgeon or hospital was there to get us for the many years we evolved. And so, of course, we know that we immediately begin to break down muscle, to fuel our immune system, to fuel our need for calories and need for energy in the face of stress to run away from the tiger or survive it, but that leads to insulin resistance, and it leads to ultimately long-term catabolism. This can last for up to four weeks after colorectal surgery, just simple colorectal surgery. I've already told you it can last for years after critical illness. And so the development of insulin resistance we're discovering is a unifying theme in the catabolism our patients develop. And so both insulin resistance and hyperglycemia are closely related to postoperative complications, even in non-diabetic, of course, patients. And being MPO prior to a stress stimulates insulin resistance. And this is fundamentally bad for us, promotes catabolism, promotes muscle loss. It exacerbates stress response. It does all the negative things that we don't want, including impairing gastrointestinal function, right? That's what gets you out of the hospital when you poop and when you're able to eat, Insulin resistance impairs that. How long are patients actually in PO? It's more striking than you think. A Brazilian study showed it's between 12 and 18 hours in most patients. It can be longer if your case is delayed. We've heard about cancellations. People can be in PO for days sometimes, waiting for surgery. And there's Cochrane data to show that there's no evidence to say that having these shortened fasting periods for up to two hours before surgery leads to any risk. And in fact, most data would say that stimulating the stomach with some fluid within two hours of surgery actually helps it empty better because it creates the bolus that stimulates gastric emptying. And in fact, most people have more volume in their stomach if they don't drink two hours before surgery than if they did. But yet, somehow that hasn't been conveyed in our specialty. So you could do that with water. So why the carbohydrate loading? Well, we know from animal studies that survival is better if you... Carbohydrate load an animal before a stress. We know it reduces fatigue post-exercise in athletes at every level. And it reduces all kinds of other complications. This is actually a way to measure the glycogen content of the muscle. Um, this is an ultrasound device that I've worked with a group to develop that does this. So short-term fasting is an unnatural way to prepare for stress. How many of you in this room have run a marathon? A lot. How many of you run any race, 5K or greater? How many of you are MPO from midnight before doing it, or MPO for 18 hours before it? I ran a marathon, some couple in medical school as well, and no way I was MPO. I drank gallons of fluid and ate enormous amounts of carbohydrate like all the rest of us do. But yet when our patients are faced with the most important marathon of their lives, why do we starve them? 
None of us would do that. And we can actually measure the preparedness now. I will show you of their muscle for surgery, how glycogen or carbohydrate loaded they are. This is a Tour de France writer getting this measured. But what happens to muscle glycogen levels after stress? This is a unique device that does this. This is what a perfectly loaded, carbohydrate-loaded athlete looks like. A dark, that nice dark muscle there, waterfalls, glycogen, that's how you measure it. That's what a moderately active person looks like, most of you in this room probably. And then we looked at different things from running a marathon down to playing at elite soccer levels, and your levels dropped to in the 50s after running a marathon. We did 12 critically ill patients in our surgical ICU. The average level in the first seven was zero. The average level all was four. They would go to zero within two days. So being critically ill is like running four or five marathons. This is what their ultrasound looks like on this device. I'll show you a better picture in just a moment. They've added color to it now. The dark purple areas are the well glycogen-loaded areas. The light purple areas are not. The green is dying muscle. It's necrotic muscle. Different illnesses cause different amounts of necrosis, but you can see all the light purple there in the sepsis patient. That's incredible glycogen depletion. No one had ever seen a zero until they started coming into the ICU in the post-op setting. I actually had my muscle glycogen measured after this surgery. I was in the OR for eight hours. My glycogen was 40. I was in pretty good shape coming in, I thought. But I still ended up quite depleted, more than running a marathon after just a large operation. So the idea of ERAS, of course, and carb loading is to make patients better than they were when they came to us. And I think that's the whole concept now. Not just do what's right, but make them better. And we know that insulin sensitivity predicts complications after cardiac surgery, including death and severe infection. So this needs to be avoided. This is independent of diabetes. The worst people to become hyperglycemic are those that never had diabetes in the first place. Right? We know that from the ICU literature. Mortality is tenfold higher if you have new stress hyperglycemia versus if you're hyperglycemic because you're a diabetic and you remained hyperglycemic. So can pre-op carb loading change this? And, of course, this is how all the data that's done it has done it. They give a 12.5% complex carbohydrate drink, 400 mils two hours before anesthesia. I know here in England, Monty gives one the night before as well. But we know from that data that it definitely does reduce insulin resistance. There's studies in many different kinds of surgery show this carb load can reduce insulin resistance. IV carbohydrates can do it as well. So if the patient didn't get carb loaded orally, there's some hint, Franco Carly has explained to me, and this evidence shows, that you can do it IV as well, by giving IV dextrose perhaps. So you can see that perhaps you can reduce the insulin resistance. The other question is, can you improve the glycogen stores of the muscle and the liver? This was a study that actually looked at that, looking at this case in liver, and you can. So a carb load preoperatively can restore the glycogen content of different cells in the body that require it to function properly. And this is important in the muscle because when the muscle has no glycogen stores, it has to break down muscle and amino acids for energy to fuel its own cells, much less the body's immune cells. So very low glycogen, that muscle could never be anabolic. And so you don't want that. What are our clinical outcomes for this? We know that carb loading reduces nausea, reduces pain, reduces vomiting, reduces anxiety. There's a Cochrane analysis, GI surgery patients who it was done in, reduced length of stay a day and a half. This is a five US dollar intervention, right? Reduces length of stay by a day and a half. So this is a compelling reason that we understand the mechanism in science for. But you have to do it right. And there's all kinds of ways I've heard in the US and around the world that it's done, right? This is what's actually been studied. Usually 50 grams of complex carbohydrate, low in osmolality, so it empties the stomach properly. But I hear of all kinds of things from orange juice to Gatorade being used in place of this. So what about sports drinks? They don't look anything like what was studied. They contain 6 to 7% of a simple sugar, no maltodextrin typically, and they're very high in osmolality, which delays their gastric emptying and delays their uptake in the stomach and in the small bowel. This is not the ideal thing to give, and you can't be assured that they're going to empty it. You give them this and they aspirate, you can't defend yourself with literature around carb loading because it didn't study this. And the physiologist would tell you it doesn't make sense to give this because it's likely to empty slower. The other piece is it needs to be consumed quickly. You can't drink this over an hour or it won't work. It won't create the stimulation of insulin that you need to prevent insulin resistance. This can't be sipped. It needs to be drunk over five minutes. Franco Carly taught me that. And... Clearly, as he studied it, it showed that the AUC and the insulin resistance was much different if it was sipped 
versus if it was drunk over a short period of time. So if you're going to do this, do it right. Because if it's sipped, it won't do the same thing. And that's not what we want. And then compared with other carbohydrate polymers, maltodextrin clearly empties the stomach faster from the studies that have been done. And this is likely related to the osmolality of the sugar and its ability to empty the stomach. And so this has been studied as well. Glucose-containing solutions empty faster than fasting alone, in fact. And so this is probably safer than being MPO, if done correctly. Some people say, well, why don't we put amino acid in? That'd be brilliant. We could add some protein to it. We could add some arginine or citrulline to it, and we can create a little immune nutrition drink out of it. That's less than ideal. We know that citrulline and arginine actually produce nitric oxide and delay gastric emptying. Other amino acids may do this as well. So there's a lack of safety for adding these amino acids. We went through this in the ICU when we tried to use immune nutrition in septic patients. It delayed gastric emptying dramatically in those patients, and they'd have big residuals. So arginine addition or other amino acid addition likely slows that. So although it seemed like a good idea, it's likely not physiologically. So this seems like a no-brainer. It costs $5. It can be done in 10 minutes. But do we? We've heard data that we don't. And yet this is perhaps the simplest intervention in all of ERAS, I would advocate. So last piece here that needs to be covered is what do we do after surgery? I had questions about it last time. So, of course, we recommend a high-protein diet for patients. This idea of clear liquids or full liquids have to be abandoned. Clear liquids are nothing but salt and sugar. I remember I got them for about five days when I finally was able to eat with IBD, and I gained 28 pounds on steroids in five days, and I have stretch marks to this day to show it. It is a worthless, dangerous diet. It should not be used for prolonged periods of time. Eggs and pancakes is what my old-time surgeon taught me to eat, and it's still the best thing to eat. Simple sugars and lots of high-quality protein. Oral nutrition supplements serve that purpose as well. Seems like it'd be easy, right? And so all patients should be easily getting fed in the recovery room. This is my now eight-year-old who was three at the time. He was easily fed all the time. But unfortunately, patients not so much. They did a survey in the state of New York, and they asked, in any given day, how many patients are MPO in all the hospital beds in the state of New York? 50% of patients practically are MPO in any given day in any hospital. If I ran a prison and I starved half the prisoners, they would fire me but it happens in hospitals around the world, and everyone thinks it's okay. Why is that? This is part of why it is. Patients not get enough bowel sounds. We can't feed them, right? Do bowel sounds matter? Even the TV doctors in the U.S. know they don't matter. There is no evidence for this. They don't predict gut function. They're not related to the size of surgery, and they have no relationship to bowel function other than if you have a bowel obstruction, then they're quite useful. They get high-pitched, and then you can have, say, the patient has borbogamy if you can spell it. But other than that, they're useless. And in fact, this has been shown in lots of meta-analyses that feeding in the recovery room versus waiting for bowel sounds at three or four days don't lead to more wound dehiscence or more anastomotic dehiscence or vomiting or anything else. But at least in this almost 1,000 patient meta-analysis, it reduced mortality 60%. If that's 6%, that's an enormous number of patients. 35 million plus people have surgery of meaningful type in the U.S. every year. That's a big difference. In fact... Ollie Lundquist has shown us that the way you feed people around the day of surgery or the day after actually affects them five years later. People who got 70% compliance with ERAS in this large retrospective study who had cancer had 42% better survival. So the way you give ERAS changes people's lives five years later. Two factors drove that, fluid balance and oral intake on post-op day one. So feeding the recovery room may change someone's life five years later. Reaching protein goal is more important than calorie goal. You've heard that before. This was actually a study that was just published in the last few months that shows it. They gave a high-protein oral nutrition supplement to colorectal surgery patients in an ERAS protocol. They bumped their protein about 0.2 grams per kilo per day, and they reduced length of stay by four days. High-protein oral nutrition supplements for the few days after surgery changes length of stay. This is the highest impact factor clinical nutrition journal in the world, by the way. So this is a meaningful trial, at least to those of us in nutrition. Do I need to tell you any more? This works. But do we? So we survey this around the world every year, a group I work with. Most patients, at least in the U.S., and I would gather a venture in many countries, are in PO for more than three days postoperatively, waiting for bowel sounds. We actually showed that nutrition is delivered the poorest in surgical patients among any other kind of patient in the hospital. It started the latest. They get a third of the calories that we actually prescribe that they need for two weeks, not for two days. And GI and cardiac surgery patients are fed the very poorest of any patient in the hospital every time we do the survey for 15 years. 
How is that possible when we have ERAS and we know the difference? So we need to do better. And so we recommend protocols help make this better. I mean, nutrition should be considered for the seven days after surgery as well as the five days before. And we recommend early internal nutrition followed by PN if internal nutrition goals of 60% or more aren't met. And so that's where the parental nutrition comes in. And we recommend that all patients get an oral nutrition supplement for a month after surgery. We know they will never eat enough. We've studied it. It's just we know they're not going to eat enough. They're not going to eat enough protein. They're going to continue to lose weight. We're not evolved to be hungry and eat well after we are sick. And that's where the oral nutrition supplement comes in, and there's a lot of data for this. There's meta-analyses that show in broad hospital populations it reduces mortality in many small studies, significant reduction of hospital complications. We decided that wasn't enough, and so a group that I work with, the Premier Database, which is a large database, 51 million patients in the U.S., and we found almost a million people who'd gotten an oral nutrition supplement over a two-year period in the U.S. We matched those to another 725,000 who didn't get one, and it reduced length of stay 21% in the patients who did get it, and every dollar spent on oral nutrition supplements saved $52 in hospital costs. This is more cost-effective than aspirin or statins or anything else, and it has no risk and virtually no cost. And there's a large randomized trial now. This is the other piece we needed. This is almost a 700-patient randomized trial in multiple centers across the U.S. that showed that giving oral nutrition supplements for the three months after a major hospitalization reduces death by half. So this may be the most effective thing you can do for your patients, and the most cost-effective for sure, that doesn't get done right now. This is the last piece I'll say. Nutrition alone is not enough. This is Mike and Denny's slide that I stole. And, you know, I'll hear from patients, I'm too sick to exercise. I'll hear from even physicians, my patient's too sick to exercise. But I want you to look closely at this next video. This is a Brazilian ICU in a rural part of Brazil. It's a government hospital. This is a patient Um, doing bed squats on a ventilator. Day one after Services major surgery. Tomorrow for a Houston couple no one is too sick to exercise the three young paralyzed. children who were also in the car or in a hospital. In fact, they make beds to make this work better. Why don't we all have these beds? You can do squats and curls right in the bed. This is the future, we hope. In summary, this is the key. Majority of the patients that we have coming to us are malnourished, many of them, and we're not recognizing it. It leads to serious complications, and very few people are getting intervened on it, and it's very simple to intervene. So we need to be better at this. We have some simple recommendations from this paper. Again, protein being essential, nutrition screening has to happen, and then oral nutrition supplements are a simple, inexpensive way to deliver what patients need to recover. So now we need you to ensure that the way we feed patients is never going to be the same. And the GI surgery patients aren't the worst fed patients in the hospital anymore. We have a screening tool that you can use from this paper, your EMR, make it simple. This is the pathway we put our patients on in the new Pass Poet Clinic. They get high protein ONS for three to four weeks. That's the average time of our surgical postings for elective surgery. Immune nutrition for five days and the carb load before. And then five to seven days of more immune nutrition and three weeks of ONS, high protein or nutrition supplements. And this is the pathway. And again, nobody should come to surgery ever for elective surgery and not be screened for this. It takes less than a minute to screen people. If that had happened, maybe Joshua would still be with us today. And since perhaps this isn't the note we want to go out in, I'm going to let the people who do Eris the best take you out and remind you that it needs to be part of the whole pathway. Have you heard the news? Everyone's talking. Post on the good, cause everyone's walking. Hand operation, but recovery's fast. And limit of products, like a master. I really like E-Rex, I'm passing gas. I've eaten all the food and I easily pass. Two days later, eating the forecast, feeling like a boss. E-Rex is awesome. Stepping on my vest, grab my skateboard. It's awesome to move. It's awesome to poop. It's awesome to poop. It's awesome to poop. E-Rex is awesome. 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 E-Rex And don't forget you can meet the Top Med Talk team. All you need to do is turn up at one of our events. Check out ebpom.org for more details. ebpom.org. 
Our next big event is between the 28th and the 30th of September in Chicago. That's EBPOM USA, the Chicago Masters course, perioperative care practicum. Between the 28th and the 30th of September, ebpom.org for more details. That's ebpom.org.